This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and today we're going to look at the ASUS ZenBook Prime UX31A. Aha, but this is the touchscreen model, so basically just call it the UX31A Touch. I suspect that sooner or later they're all going to be touchscreen and they're going to do away with the non-touch models, but we'll see for now. Who knows? Anyway, it seems in the United States that Best Buy pretty much has the exclusive on the small for right now. It'll probably be in other stores soon, but it's been available at Best Buy for a bit now, and for... 1100 bucks you get everything that's good about a ZenBook Prime Plus you get a 1080p HD full HD touchscreen and we're going to look at it now. So here it is back in black the ASUS ZenBook Prime UX31A Touch Edition. Now for those of you who want to know the model number because it, it, ASUS is not really doing a great job of differentiating this here in this country right now it's UX31A-BHI5T11. Remember that write it down. BHI5T11. If we look at the lid here, it looks just like your basic ZenBook Prime, only, as I said, we have the black finish. Now, it looks very cool. This is still brushed aluminum, really solid, amazing, lovely construction, beautiful fit and finish. One thing about this black is, well, we've cleaned up the lid here, and happily, because this is all metal, you can just take a damp rag, even with a little bit of maybe a soft soap, hand soap on it, and clean this guy up, because Look at the bottom, we haven't cleaned that as much. You can see probably there's already fingerprints starting to show. I'll just touch it right here and I don't have particularly oily hands. Look at that. Ew. So that's the one drawback to the black finish. Now that's probably because they do have a clear coating on top of this to protect the metal and it's just picking up fingerprint oil. Funny thing is the internal touch screen on it does not pick up fingerprints very much at all in comparison to the body. So be prepared to clean this with your damp rag every so often because it's going to get mucky, yucky looking. While we're looking at the bottom right here, you can see again, typical ZenBook design, teeny Torx screws hold this bottom plate on. This is an Ultrabook with an Intel Core i5 ULV CPU inside and you know Ultrabooks, there's not a whole lot of upgradable parts on here, but at least you can pop this bottom off if you want to get access to the battery and the internals. RAM is soldered on, but you can access the MSATA SSD drive on this. Air vents here on the bottom, nothing exceptional there. Speaker grill right here, speaker grill right here on that side. Kind of hard to see. Puts out a reasonable amount of audio, about what you would expect from a 13.3 inch notebook. Has bang and all of a sudden ice audio, as do Asus's other ZenBook models. And how much does that do for sound? I don't know. I can't hear a whole lot of difference there myself, to tell you the truth. Here's that signature tapered design that they've been using for a while. Very, very thin at the front, a little bit thicker at the back, but still very skinny. Weighs three pounds, by the way. And here we have our headphone port. We have a little LED light that's flashing right now to let us know that the thing is asleep. So here's our HDMI port, our mini VGA port, and this comes with dongle adapters. Asus likes to give you little adapters in the box. The USB 3.0 port with sleep and charge. That's our charging port right there to charge the laptop itself. And as we turn it right here, you can see, again, really nice fit and finish, nicely machined edges, rounded off over here, rounded corners, so nothing sharp, doesn't hurt your hand like, say, the Acer Aspire S7 does it a bit. We look at this side, and we've got another USB 3.0 port right here, a headphone jack, and a full-size SD card slot. Yay! Nothing much else to see right there. There's a little lip to make it easier carved out so you can lift up the screen. And now here it is obviously opened up and you can see our beautiful full HD dis display right here. 1920 by 1080 pixels. Unlike the ZenBook Prime UX 31A not touch, this is a gloss display. Touch screens almost always these days are gloss displays probably because well, they're an awful lot easier to clean up when they're glossy. As you can see, touch screen, five points of multi-touch right here. Works just fine for pinch zooming. Everything is very responsive. Just what you'd want from a Windows 8 notebook. And really, I tell you, Windows 8 is so much more enjoyable when you have a touch screen. So I think that this guy wins over the traditional UX 31A. Unless you're one of those folks who really prefers the matte display. And uh, you say you do professional graphics editing. And you could care less about the touch experience. But it's really the screen quality that matters to you. Speaking of screen quality, this has very good color saturation. It almost covers the Adobe sRGB spectrum, which is not quite as good as the matte display on the regular ZenBook Prime. That one has an even wider color gamut, but this one is pretty good as notebooks go, better than most on the market, as a matter of fact, and colors are very pleasing. 
and the default color balance is also pretty good. Now this is a desktop background that I use a lot and I can tell you that the yellow is often terribly absent right here and I've got good yellow saturation and that's a sign of having a good color gamut. So what does this guy have inside? Right now it's available with a Core i5 1.7 GHz 3317 u That's pretty much your standard Ultrabook CPU that's in lots of models. No sign of refreshing that. There's an Intel minor refresh we've seen in some competing models that brings it up to 1.8 gigahertz. I really wouldn't obsess too much on that. You're looking at a couple of percentage points difference in performance. Nothing really to write home about. We have 4 gigs of RAM. Again, that's DDR3 dual channel, which is nice. Soldered on board and it has 128 gig SSD. Ours was made by a data. Good speed and performance from the SSD for reads and writes. So we're happy with that. It has Intel Wi-Fi 802.11bgn, and that's a Centrino Advanced N6235. It's dual band, and it supports, therefore, Intel Wi-Di. Good times there for wireless display, so you don't have to use that mini HDMI, or rather micro HDMI port, and plug this into your TV. You can just use the wireless display feature. Also has Bluetooth 4.0. There is no NFC on board. There is no GPS. You usually don't see a GPS in a laptop unless it happens to have a 3G or 4G module, which this doesn't. Right now, this is only available with the Core i5 in the U.S. i7, maybe it'll come in the future, I don't know. But again, given how much more expensive the i7 ULV CPU usually is above the i5, I, it's not often worth the money, because often you're going to pay about 300 bucks more. When it is worth the money is if that comes bundled with a 256 gig SSD for those who need more storage. And speaking of storage, take a look at my computer right there. You can see how much space that I have left right now, and I have... 51 gigs out of my 128 gig SSD. Now it reports that about uh, 100 gigs are available because the other space is taken up by your recovery partition, something you probably don't want to remove as, at least until you make up a USB backup of that recovery partition. But really, out of the box, I had more like 70 after Windows was installed and related applications and ASUS bundled software. By the way, this is pretty clean. This is a near Microsoft's signature level of cleanliness here, so you really don't have much bloatware on there. So that's not a whole lot of space to work with, so keep that in mind. You can, of course, put media on external USB hard drives on that SD card, since you've got an SD card slot, to put your media and stuff on there. But I'm down to that much space after installing some pretty heavy stuff. I've got the full Adobe Photoshop CS6 installed on here, Office 2013, the whole package, including Access 2013, Outlook, Word, PowerPoint, Excel, all the goodies from that, and I have Civ 5 installed, and that takes up about 4 gigs of storage. So it's kind of a real-world scenario there where a couple of heavy applications are going to put there, some, some light applications, they don't really take up much room, though. Now, Seuss likes to give you a lot of stuff in the box when you get a ZenBook Prime. So first off, inside the very boring outer cardboard box, you get this fancy presentation box. That's become a fairly standard thing to do with Ultrabooks. And notice it says Sand Force Driven here, for those of you who are really into which SSD you get from the old days of the ZenBook Prime when there was a little bit of a canoe room about getting a slower versus faster one. There's our sticker on the inner box, but I think it's safe to say they're pretty much going to be all fast SSDs. Seuss has learned their lesson there with people having a little fit. So inside you get the usual Seuss little brown pouch that holds your adapters, and this comes with two adapters in here, and this one's still wrapped in plastic. This is the USB Ethernet adapter, handy for you Road Warriors business types who need wired Ethernet. And also in the box we get the mini VGA to full-size VGA for those of you who need to use older monitors or projectors that use VGA. And that does not use up a USB port. Again, there is a mini VGA port on the laptop. Something new here, ASUS includes a USB to micro USB shorty cable. I imagine this is for those of you who need to take your smartphone on the road and charge it up or sync it up, and they give you a little shorty cable so you don't have to take along the long one that came with your phone. And lastly, we get the brown pouch, the ubiquitous ZenBook Prime brown. Kind of ballistic -y nylon, leather flap over here. It gets the job done. Soft, nice in here, microfibery kind of stuff. So all that comes in the box. That's nice. Oh, and lastly, of course, you get a charger too. Charger is always good. And here's our charger. Nothing much has changed there. It's the same block style that ASUS has been using with their ZenBook machines and also with their Transformer Android tablets. Uh, and uh, 
obviously at different amperages and voltages, but this is the same as we've seen for the other UX31s. But now that this one here is in black, they actually match color-wise. Woohoo! So these pull out, and you'll get the prongs for your proper country if you happen to be not in the U.S., and you get a decent amount of cord on here, as you can see. Going back to looking at the hardware, by the way, screen brightness on this is pretty good. We've disabled automatic brightness. Uh, that's a Windows 8 feature that almost universally makes the display too dark in most indoor settings unless you're in a bright place. And we are getting 365 looks from the display and brightness in this. That's, that's good. That's a pretty bright display. It's not insanely bright like some Asus Transformer, like a TF700 Transformer Android tablet, but as laptops go, that's pretty bright. No complaints with that, and it helps fight the glare as well. If we take a look at the keyboard, first off, this is how far back you can put the display. Reasonably far back. Since this is an IPS display, viewing angles are extremely wide. You're not going to be spending a whole lot of time fiddling the display back and forth to try to find the sweet spot anyway on this. Now here's our keyboard, and I like what they've done here, both aesthetically and functionally. We've got the whole black deck here, and this is kind of a matte finish, which is good so you don't get glare from here bouncing off on your glare on the display. Not as shiny at all as the outer surfaces are. Large trackpad. Finally, Asus has gotten that right. One thing I have to say about Asus is they listen to what com customers complain about, and they fix it in the next revision of the product. So the terrible trackpads of yesterday, gone. This one works just fine now. Large, buttonless, easy to use. But particularly here, the keyboard, what I like is that this silver inset right here makes it easy still to see the keys distinctly, especially in darker environments. Also, it looks really kind of cool too, doesn't it? You can see we have our audio by Bang & Olufsen Ice Power over here. They're always glad to tell us about that. And this is a backlit keyboard, and you can control that using the backlit keyboard button right here if you want to turn it off or on, and you can also incrementally, incrementally increase or decrease the backlight brightness as well. Since this is a skinny notebook, you can see there's not a whole lot of key relief here, not a lot of room for key travel, but it's good tactile feel, and that's a reasonable amount of movement. You can see how much that's moving. I find it a very nice keyboard to type on. It's a good size, good keyboard spacing, nice tactile feel, and firm keys. This deck here is like a rock. You cannot trampoline on this at all, so very nice typing experience. Very effective backlight. Again, good stuff. And if you're wondering how far the SD card might stick out, you can see it sticks out pretty far, so you're probably not going to want to leave that in there all the time when you're traveling. You'll just snap that bugger right off. Now for our Core i5 model right here with 4 gigs of RAM and then 128 gig ADATA SSD. On PC Mark 7, it scored 4670, which is about par for the course for an Ultrabook with that kind of internals. You can see our Windows Experience Index right here. Processor 6.9, that's pretty much what the 3317U CPU always scores on everything. 5.9 for RAM, again, that's what most machines score. For our graphics for desktop performance, 5.5. Our 3D graphics, we are at 6.4. And the SSD scores an 8.1, which is pretty much like every decent SSD on the planet on Windows 8 machines. So good performance scores there and in line with the competition. So how well can this handle applications like Visual Studio, Photoshop, and some HD video editing? Just fine. I still would like the most powerful machine possible if I was editing lots of HD video for a living, like say we actually do. But for those of you who just do it occasionally and casually, this is more than adequate. And we're going to open up a JPEG file that is over oh, 4 megs in size, taken with a Sony digital SLR camera. And we're going to open it with Adobe Photoshop. So here we are inside Photoshop. Again, this came from our 16 megapixel Sony digital SLR camera, and we'll just do a couple of things to it. First, my favorite, auto contrast. And we are editing a copy on a card. If this was on the SSD, it would be even that much quicker, but it's actually going to slow things down a little bit. And we'll do a rotation. And here's our ASUS on its side. And we'll do a filter, sharpen, unsharp mask. fifty percent and it's just fine to use so Photoshop yes full HD display is nice obviously I've got lots of room to work here my palettes don't take up much room especially because Adobe Photoshop doesn't pay any attention to desktop scaling even if you set the desktop to zoom to 125 percent you're still gonna have everything very compact here and all the menus are gonna be pretty small too but the nice part is you got lots of room to do stuff here 
And now, now while we're checking out performance, we're going to look at 1080p video playback. We have a movie trailer here, MPEG-4, high profile. Obviously, it's going to play native resolution and fill the screen. Also pretty loud. You can hear the speakers there. We're at about 55-60% oh, volume. Plays beautifully. Really, it's a lovely screen. It's just a pleasure to watch movies on. I have to say, lovely job from Masseuse here. And as you can see, the trackpad works just fine. I've got two fingers scrolling going on here. I can zoom in, zoom out, side swipe, side swipe charms in. Everything works just as it should with the trackpad, so good times for Asus on that. And lastly, we're going to test out playing Civ 5 using Steam. And uh, I've got a handy Bluetooth mouse here, so if you're wondering how the heck I'm doing things, that's how I'm doing it. And we're going to go for the DirectX 9 with Touch option. So we're going to play this at full 1080p with most effects set to medium. So now we've got the game launch, and it gives you a little instructions here on how to use multi-touch, zoom, all that kind of stuff. So our game is finally loaded. And that's us, we're England. Zooming works fine. Frame rates will get a little bit quicker once everything is all loaded and cached up here. So it's competing the other five countries moves here. And there's a war going on on another continent. So it plays pretty So it plays pretty well and if you want to get even smoother panning and scaling, then you can turn down the medium settings, make them low, that kind of thing. But I find this quite playable. Works well. So pretty good for an Ultrabook to be able to play these kinds of games. Uh, you can play Skyrim at low settings, 1366 by 768 resolution, but you're not going to play something like Crisis 3 on this. This does not have dedicated graphics. This has the usual Intel HD 4000 integrated graphics. Now, Civ 5 is a pretty demanding game. We weren't playing it for long, but the fans kicked up a little bit. This has well-tuned fans. They're not obnoxious loud, but you will hear them if you're playing something like, well, Civ 5, or you're doing HD video export, that kind of thing. And you can see we've got core temp running here to look at the core temperatures. 105 degrees centigrade is the maximum allowable. Of course, you never want to see anything close to that. And we're running pretty chillin' here, having just exited the game. We are cooled down to 45, 44 degrees centigrade. It does not get hot to the touch anywhere. This area all stays cool on your keyboard deck. The underside certainly can get warm at times. Metal does transfer heat, but nothing burning hot, so that's good. Battery life has been a pleasant surprise. So far, Windows 8 laptops and convertibles and even tablets with touchscreens have not had very good battery life. This guy has a large four-cell battery inside, bigger than most, and we've so far managed to get about six hours on a charge pretty easily with brightness set to 50% balanced power mode. Not trying hard to save any power there. Wi-Fi on and active. Bluetooth turned on, so better than average showing there. It really shows up the Acer Aspire S7 13.3 inch, which has great looks too. It's a bit more expensive, but has really abysmal battery life compared to this. So all in all, 
definitely this is a, a laptop ultrabook that i would recommend especially with windows 8 the touch screen just makes your life so much easier unless you really are allergic to touch screens and you're just going to stay in the desktop mode all the time uh, for the rest of us who actually want to use some of the windows 8 features and touch and games and things like that Wow, it's great. And for about the same price as you're going to be paying for a ZenBook Prime UX31 anyway, you get that full HD multi-touch screen on here. The usual ZenBook Prime awesome build quality. Uh, Wi-Fi reception on this, by the way, quite good. They've also figured out how to deal with having a metal casing and still have good reception on this. Fast, quiet running machine, lovely backlit keyboard, comfortable, responsive, elegant design. There's really nothing I wouldn't recommend about this. So that's the ASUS ZenBook Prime UX31A Touch, available now. As I said, for about the same price as the old ZenBook Prime, well, you get that full HD touchscreen, really nice colors on this, backlit keyboard, stunning design, sturdy, one of the sturdiest notebooks on the planet, all metal, lots of good features on this. Definitely a win. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Visit our website for the full review, and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit that like button, too.